Hi, welcome to the HPC Now podcast. Thanks for joining. This is podcast number one. The HPC Now podcast is for people that are just beginning or interested in HPC, high performance computing, and seasoned experts. We have all sorts of instructional videos uh, and interviews. We have news and views. We have a little bit of humor sprinkled in. And so, um, you know, why don't we get going on that? Today, we're going to talk about something that is frequently misunderstood in high performance computing clusters, and that is the scheduler. And so we're going to be doing a lot to debunk the scheduler, show, talk a lot about schedulers. And I have a, a very interesting guest, Dr. Albert Ruther from MIT Lincoln Lab, who's an absolute expert in this area. And he's going to tell us all about schedulers and debunk a lot of stuff. I think you'll find it pretty interesting. Uh, we have news and views with Garima Kochar. Uh, she's going to show us some very interesting things on graphics and how to present graphics. And then we're going to have some other um, interesting things here. So why don't we get going? I tell you what, I'm going to, um, I'm going to start by entering the uh, first, first uh, interview job into the cluster. And let's get rolling, OK? See you soon. Hey, so listen, um, thank you for joining HPC Now, and uh, we're looking forward to your presentation today. So yeah, I can tell you what, why don't, we, why don't we start out, why don't you introduce yourself and tell everybody, you know, uh, who you are, what you do at Lincoln Lab, and what actually maybe a little bit about what Lincoln Lab does. Sure. So my name is Albert Ruther. I am a senior technical staff member uh, at Lincoln Lab in the Lincoln Laboratory Supercomputing Center. Um, I have been at the laboratory for almost 20 years, and during those 20 years, I've worked on a variety of projects to enable parallel processing for a variety of applications, from radar to uh, bio biology uh, data analytics um, to um, radio communications and everything in between, perhaps. Um, Early on and for the past 20 years, uh, several colleagues and I have been doing high performance computing for rapid prototyping, which means fielding very large systems that have rapid turnaround capabilities, particularly for languages like MATLAB, uh, Python, mm -hmm. and now yep. Julia. And so we enable users to do big data analysis, uh, big simulations, um, and also uh, work with the data that comes out of those simulations in getting fast turnaround for yeah. our sponsors. Yeah, just out of curiosity, uh, Albert, what, what's, how's Julia is really getting catching on, isn't it? It is catching on. Uh, we have a couple of groups that have really jumped into using Julia for all the right reasons. Um, it is a really yeah, nice, uh, <laughs> it's a nice uh, language for doing scientific computing and data analysis, and even for machine learning training and inference. So Yeah, I remember um, a couple of years ago or so, two or three years ago, I remember I was at a, a trading show, and uh, one of the guys who actually started Julia was there, mm -hmm. and he came over and we were talking, and I go, wow, this looks like a really cool language. And I guess it was first adopted in the financial community. Is that, do you know? The, the financial then, community has really run with it because it's a yeah. rapid prototyping. It's a rapid development language, a compile and time language that has a very elegant mathematical interface set uh, with mm -hmm. a lot of, a lot of contributions. So yeah, um, yeah they, they're always, financial folks are always looking for some more speed. So. Yes, they are. <laughs> so, okay, cool. That's great. So let's get back to the subject of schedulers. Sure. Um, uh, you've done a lot of work on schedulers, all right? That's and right. maybe maybe what you, a portion of our the people watching may have heard about what a scheduler is. Maybe you might start off by telling us a little bit what the purpose of a scheduler is. Sure. Uh, well, a scheduler um, is really the interface that you have to a massive number of machines, and usually machines that are shared. And so what it does is it, it expands your interface from either the command line or web page or something like that from the single computer that you're on, um, directing your jobs to gaining access to these shared resources. And so it does that by monitoring the, um, monitoring the resources that are available. 
um, keeping checks on the jobs that are currently running, as well as the machines that are running those jobs, and then providing an interface to the user. Perhaps I can illustrate this best with a, uh, a, a slide here that shows, sure. um, yep. that shows kind of the components. That'd be great. Cross your fingers. Here we go. Excellent. Can see it. All right. Well, so I've color coded these parts. There's four, my, four primary tasks that a scheduler does. Uh, there's job management, resource management, and scheduling, and job execution. And I've talked about a, a, a little bit about each, but let's jump into this a little bit more. Um, on the user side, the user side sees the job lifecycle management part, which is over on the left side of the diagram in the yellow. Yeah. And what that entails is a series of policies. Um, it's a job queue as well as uh, a results capability, a, a way to get results back from all those uh, resources. Over on the right hand side in kind of the orangish tan uh, is what the administrator mainly works with and that's the resource management side. So the scheduler is uh, polling the resources, the, the nodes in the cluster, the GPUs in the cluster, seeing what their loads are, seeing what jobs are running on them, monitoring the jobs if they're running on them. If no jobs are running on them, it's still monitoring those nodes to see what's going on. Um, are they healthy? Is it uh, responding as expected to be uh, confident that if, I dis if the scheduler dispatches a job to that node, um, that it will run uh, well? Yeah. Um, so no, well, I'm just going to ask you, there's a lot yeah. of dials also with a, there, with a scheduler, right? There are a lot of dials, absolutely. Well, let's go to the scheduling. That's actually where a lot of those dials are, are in place. Um, I have uh, policies in each of these three categories, but the, the place where a lot of the dials are is here in the scheduling. And that's where the jobs that are submitted by the user over on the left come into play with the resources that are available over on the right. right. Um, the scheduler figures out what's the often what's the most optimal job uh, to run next, as well as what are the best resources to run to satisfy the, that job's resource needs, as well as to kind of optimize across the entire set of pending jobs, as well as uh, running jobs at the moment. The winning job, so to speak, that gets scheduled next, then gets job assigned, and then that goes into the job uh, execution phase, which is in that uh, minty green box down at the bottom, where the job is then dispatched to the nodes that are running the job. Um, the resource manager watches them, job monitoring, feeds back to the user what's going on on those nodes, what's going on with their jobs. It's running on the compute cluster, and then they run to completion. There's a job retirement phase where then job logs are, are, are written out for the user, and the user can see what's going on. Um, then there's knobs even in the policies of, of what goes in the queue, what order they go into the queue, the jobs go into the queue and so on. And then there's also policies on how to manage the resources. For instance, you may not want to have all the cores on every compute node be advertised as a usable core to the user. You may want to save a couple cores for the operating system and other local resources, uh, local uh, processes to run on that cluster node. Um, so there's there's a lot of knobs to be uh, to be uh, dialed in, um, but uh, I'm figuring not to dive into those a whole lot here. Yeah, that's okay. That's all right. So you've done a lot of work on schedulers, right? We've done a lot of work on schedulers. You want to um, you want to talk all a the way bit about back. Yeah, so um, in order to enable that rapid prototyping capability that I was talking about for the lab and for MIT campus, um, we uh, it became pretty clear early on within actually the first year of us building this capability that uh, I wasn't going to be able to write my own schedule. I actually did write my own scheduler uh, in the first year. It was terrible. It, uh, and I <laughs> realized pretty soon that enabling all sorts of policies that were valuable was not going to be uh, my, <laughs> my contribution to the field. Um, and so uh, that put us on a, on a uh, journey of working with a number of different schedulers. So we've run Condor, we've run uh, IBM Platform LSF, we've run uh, Sun Grid Engine, now Oracle Grid Engine, we've run mm -hmm. PBS. More recently, we've been running Slurm on our systems. 
We've also run Kubernetes, we've run Mesos, we've run Yarn, we've run the underlying Hadoop scheduler to be able to compare and contrast what is the best scheduler for our scheduling needs and also f on the broader sense for government customers that we have. Um, not only have we built our own capability, but uh, I've been involved in helping build over 70 clusters that have gone into uh, analysis teams uh, on the ground. They've mm -hmm. been in ground stations for sensors. They've been actually, several of them have flown. A couple of them have been on bread trucks <laughs> as ground stations. So we've deployed clusters everywhere. And because of those unique needs, sometimes what we run on our flagship LLSC systems is not the best solution for those bread trucks and airplane schedulers. So uh, we have a lot of experience with that. And it gave us the opportunity to write a few papers on what are the trade-offs between schedulers. So um, maybe in the next couple of slides, I think it would be worthwhile to uh, talk about some of those trade-offs between uh, a couple of different types of major categories of jobs, and then what the trade-offs are to help our listeners uh, get a better understanding. I, I think that would be great. I think that's right. great. Well, so let's jump to the next uh, slide here. Um, the two, I, I'm, I'm dancing around the subject because I wanted to get to this slide um, in terms of the two paradigms. I think there's two major paradigms that we see nowadays in running on big compute hardware. The what, first one is the traditional supercomputing paradigm. The other one, I'm calling the big data paradigm, but we can name it a number of other things, a cloud paradigm, a machine learning yeah, paradigm, yeah. but it's kind of this uh, rapid uh, on-demand processing for uh, AI systems that are used in big cloud instances. Um, it's often billed as being two really different paradigms, but quite honestly, they're, they're trying to do the same thing for two different audiences. And I think it's really important to know that so that you choose the right scheduler um, for your users, for your administra administrators, and particularly for the job types that you have. So mm -hmm. in traditional supercomputing, um, they, they look at jobs as ha being kind of three different uh, three different uh, sub paradigms there. There's single process jobs um, that over on the graph um, on the right side, they tend to run from anywhere of a few seconds to sometimes days, but they're only single process jobs and they may occupy an entire compute node, but not more than that. Um, and they are independent. If you're submitting multiple of these single processes, they're completely independent. Um, they don't communicate with each other at all. There's then, if you have a number of jobs, single jobs that all are running the same executable and maybe are doing a parameter sweep or a Monte Carlo simulation like that, you might bundle those up as a job array. And those are a series of single independent processes as a group. It just makes uh, running multiple single processes more convenient because you can kill them all if you realize, oh man, I messed up with some line in the, in the and it's giving me numerical uh, inaccuracies. You can just kill the whole bunch of jobs rather than killing one job at a time. And then finally, the, the workhorse of the supercomputing uh, paradigm is these parallel jobs. And these are often the computational right. fluid dynamics jobs, electromagnetic simulation jobs, um, weather simulations and stuff like that. And those are really special jobs because you need to launch a set of processes at the same time and they are all running and communicating with each other to solve a big problem. They are not independent at all. They're completely dependent, so much so that they're synchronously launched. And oftentimes people will talk about these as being MPI jobs. And right. I depict those as those blue boxes over on the right. Um, they can be kind of small and short running, like uh, more interactive prototyping jobs that we tend to run on the LLSC systems, but they can run for weeks uh, at the big national labs, the DOE labs. They're running for weeks, often running on tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of cores. Yeah, so it's kind of funny because when we talk to customers about what HPC is, one of the things we say is it's the complete opposite of inverse of virtual computing, right? Exa exactly. It is the complete inverse because a lot of the things with virtual computing are is a convenience, but you sacrifice a lot of performance for those conveniences. And uh, I like to, th those kind of big horsepower, big compute jobs, I like to uh, make an analogy to Formula One racing because, you know, most of yeah. us n never get to drive a Formula One car. Those are performance, performance, performance vehicles um, that uh, 
most of us mere mortals really don't even know how to operate. Um, I hate to say it, but uh, it takes a lot of practice to run on those really big uh, DOE systems. But right, gosh, right. they are fun to use. <laughs> <laughs> Just like I have to imagine a Formula One car is so much fun to drive. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, and I mean, some of the training goes all the way back to grad school for the folks that run those on those systems. Um, it's yeah, not yeah. it's not uh, it's not unobtainable for most of us, but it does take some practice and a lot of learning to get to run on those systems. So let's jump then to the big big data, big cloud paradigm. Um, okay. They have three types of jobs too. They have these immediate high throughput jobs, often microsecond, millisecond, maybe a second or five second jobs that are just, they're time critical. They're trying to push a lot, sometimes hundreds of thousands or millions of these little processes through. There's other jobs that can wait a while. Those are high throughput batch jobs. They're also completely independent, but maybe not so time critical. And then often they set up these services that are also completely independent. They're persistently executing sometimes for days and weeks, um, but again, they're independent jobs. And so that then leads me into the next slide, which um, kind of helps uh, do some trade-off analysis on which kind of schedulers you wanna use for which types of jobs. So for supercomputing schedulers, I mean, there's, there's a, we didn't even touch on priorities and accounting mechanisms to, to uh, yeah. figure out who's running what job at what priority, um, what is the best job to run at a given time, given that there may be some really large uh, synchronously parallel jobs that need to run, and I need to clear off some nodes to run those. Um, they accommodate a wide variety of uh, submission modes from batch queue, which means throw it into the queue and then let the scheduler decide when to run. You can yep. run reservations that reserve a, a set of nodes for a certain period of time to run very interactively. We run very uh, interactively, but we also accommodate batch jobs alongside. So that flexibility is beautiful there. What it does mean though, it, because you can run all these different types of jobs, um, there tends to be uh, more of a, a user interface at the command line, writing scripts to do analysis, yep. writing yep. scripts to submit. Um, it gives you a great deal of, of flexibility, but you don't have this easy, uh, super easy way right, of using right. an API to submit the jobs. There are APIs for Python, Java, but it's not kind of the first line way to interact with the scheduler. And I, I listed a couple of schedulers here that um, I mentioned them already, but let's mention them again. Slurm, IBM uh, load sharing facility, LSF. It's beautiful. They're all beautiful schedulers. PBS Pro, Torque, and Moab are kind of in this family, PBS family of schedulers. Um, they all do a lot of the same things, but there are some subtleties between what they enable and, and not enable. Um, and some of them are open source. Some of them are not. Some the open source, some of them you can get uh, 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 support for so, uh, beyond just buying the software. Yeah, so do, do you have any guidance for the people watching this on, you know, wow, these are all, look at all these different uh, schedulers here. Uh, which ones would be best for me? Is there any high level advice you have on well, users? Well, let's at this? step through the big data cloud schedulers and then we'll, let's do some trade off analysis there on advice of what Perfect. to do. Perfect. Um, so for the big data schedulers, it generally is much more simple queuing system. There is some prioritization, um, but that me because it has a, it's designed with a, a simple scheduling system so that they have very low latency to moving jobs. And it's actually a, a very uh, active um, research area to bring that latency down even further. Um, the you know I mentioned a uh, very easy uh, API to to use these schedulers. Um, they have integrated support for things like Docker and Singularity, but in that integrated support, you're kind of hemmed into only delivering software via Docker or Singularity. You have to build those. There is, there's definitely a lot of applications that are just delivered by Docker and Singularity, but you are kind of hemmed in there. Um, there is no support for MP synchronously parallel jobs like MPI jobs. Um, mm. No native support. Um, the Apache Mesos scheduler, which is uh, a scheduler for schedulers, actually does have a sort of a mechanism that you have to build in to uh, enable uh, these kind of MPI jobs, but it's not, it's not the first line. It's not what they're built for, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. And it is very much programming API first, 
there is command line interfacing, but um, th those are uh, definitely not the way to interface with these. And typical schedulers here are Kubernetes, uh, Apache Mesos, and, and Hadoop Yarn. Um, the trade-offs really are primarily what your user base and applications are about, um, as well as, uh, yeah, what, what your users are used to. Um, I would definitely go with uh, something like Kubernetes or Mesos. If all I'm running is a bunch of data analysis, uh, kind of data science workloads uh, with perhaps some machine learning training. Although uh, even with machine learning training, I really appreciate the flexibility that I have with a, with a supercomputing scheduler um, in how I do the distributed training, how I distribute jobs, and how I um, yeah. can... Uh, enable priorities of different users to use different resources. Um, but uh, some, some houses, uh, this is what they do. And so there's uh, the clear choice there is to use something like Mesos or Kubernetes. Um, if you have a more broad workload, uh, more broader user base um, that are like we do with rapid prototyping from computational fluid dynamics all the way to machine learning code and lot, lots of um, yeah, and lots of all stuff different in workloads. Between. Yeah, yeah. Um, we found that using a supercomputing scheduler uh, is by far the better better way to go. There is there are ways to layer them, but now we're getting into huge complexities. We've actually run uh, Apache Mesos as jobs under Slurm, um, and we've researched running Kubernetes as our major scheduler and running Slurm underneath that. That actually uh, doesn't work very well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, but we, uh, we've actually gone so far as using Slurm as our major scheduler and then enabling Hadoop schedulers, Meso schedulers um, underneath that, uh, as well as some other uh, supercomputing schedulers as actually on the dynamic cluster that we have launched via Slurm. So there are some very sophisticated things that you can do here. Um, and a lot of fun ways to really dig into schedulers. Um, yeah, you know, one of the reasons why you know, I asked you to do this episode uh, in calling on customers. We have, there's a lot of misinformation about how to set this stuff up, how to use it. And also uh, there's a lot of confusion on, you know, can I use Kubernetes with Slurm and what is the benefit of that? Or do I use, try to use, you know, do I try to pay, take a supercomputing schedule and run it in a, a, a big data cloud environment? And so, uh, you know, this is very helpful here. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad it is. Um, well, I, I should add, uh, we were one of my sponsors a few years back asked us to do a big apples to apples comparison um, of schedulers from the traditional schedulers to big data schedulers to see what the trade offs are. Yeah. And you can see at the bottom of this slide, the two papers that came out of that. The uh, conference paper on the bottom is kind of a nice six page, five, six page overview. And then the journal article in the Journal of uh, Parallel and Distributed Computing just digs right in. It has a whole slew of categories of trade-offs to be made and then an analysis on how to run, how to best run uh, big data, uh, machine learning, uh, data analysis types of jobs yep. on supercomputing clusters. Yep, yep. Very cool. So those those uh, those uh, papers are accessible. Those papers the... are accessible via archive as well as through the uh, through IEEE and uh, JPDC uh, websites. Okay. Thank you. All right. This is great. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that's a nice, concise review of schedulers. Uh, I learned a whole lot here. This is Wonderful. fantastic. Wonderful. Yeah, I have one great. more comment. I have one more comment. Go ahead. Um, I, I, I can imagine some of your customers even say, asking, you know, is it worthwhile to install a scheduler versus just having a bunch of compute nodes available and having my users oh, kind of, yeah. you know, doing scheduling yeah, yeah, down right. the hallway, yelling down the yeah, hallway, yeah, you know, I yeah. got compute nodes one through eight, get off. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I have to say, uh, you know, I, Early on in our project, first few months, I was doing that sort of down the hall yelling scheduler. Um, that is not worthwhile. Yeah. It is not sustainable, and it is definitely not scalable. So, right, uh, right. putting the work in to getting our users used to schedulers, uh, especially when we um, scale our clusters over, say, eight or sixteen nodes, um, is very much worthwhile. 
it's a wonderful learning experience um, and it definitely helps with uh, mediating between users as well as even your own supercomputing team on how to best use the, the resource. Um, right. And it's a great right. way to start conversations, to keep conversations right. going about using the cluster rather than just frustrating people uh, with yelling down the hall or you know just fuming at your desk. Oh, why is that team using all those nodes? Yeah, right, 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 <laughs> so yes. Yeah, that's great advice. Thank you very much. Because I, I encounter that with customers also, especially when they're just starting out. They, start, yep. they get a few nodes and more users find out about the nodes and they want to start using them. And then yep. it becomes a wild west. And, it it, and, it's, it's, and then everybody, some people are really ticked off. Some people are <laughs> gaming it. They figure out how to get around it. You know? yep. So you know, we, we, try to, uh, we try to caution them or advise them. You, know, you might want to, even at this point where you just have a few nodes, Put a scheduler in to make everything you know make sense out of you know tame the wild west you know? yeah and get your your users used to using the schedule and scheduler right, and right. mediating that um yeah once you I, I have been involved in projects like that too where we have put to, online a series of nodes and we just kind of let the wild west run and wow it 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 devolves so the entropy yeah, right. really takes <laughs> takes <hold>. right, exactly <laughs> the thermodynamics at a oh maximum. my goodness yeah, yeah right oh, yeah exactly. <laughs> so all right and well, then what's worse is then the users get used to that and they can't oh, yeah, imagine yeah, right. doing anything else. And, oh, man, you try and pry it out of their hands. No, you really need yeah. to use a scheduler. Right. And right. Uh, you end up looking very yeah. heavy handed when you really didn't need to. Yeah. You're the IT police, you know, yeah, right. like, you know, stop it. You know, I, I, yeah. I want to be able to access this. And now you're putting up all these rules, but yeah, you, know, exactly. you got to do it. You got to yeah. do it. Well, so. and it, it, it continues to be a human endeavor. Um, even though you have this technology in the way, we will get together with users pretty regularly to figure out what are the right balances between, especially our, our major users. What's the right balance? What right, is your, right. what are you doing in the next six months, 12 months? How much compute resources do you need to be, to satisfy your sponsors? Um, some people handle that with, uh, you know, accounting mechanisms. We've chosen to handle that very much on a three-month, six-month, and 12-month basis, just knowing what our users need and then adjusting, uh, just adjusting allocations accordingly. Yeah, that's, that's a good point to constantly refresh or meet with your users and make sure, you know, their needs might be changing also, right? Exactly. So you need to be able to adapt your uh, scheduling uh, policies to the uh, the how the uh, uh, your users are migrating in their in their work workloads. So. Yeah, so you, you don't want to just hide behind your technology all the time. It's right. good to interact right. with the users right. to try and uh, make everybody uh, realize that we're all actually on the same team to getting right. work done. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that can get forgotten sometimes, but yes, yeah, that's good. Yeah, this this is great, Albert. This is a fantastic presentation. Really appreciate appreciate you visiting us today and uh you know again a, a fan, great job and thank you very much for doing this oh I'm so so glad thank you tony for for including me thank you for bringing me on hpc now sure uh, yeah. this was a lot of fun all right well listen stay safe have a good weekend thank you all you right? too okay all right bye, -bye. Right, we'll see you bye Hi, Tony. Uh, I'm Garima Kocher. I'm part of the HPC uh, engineering team, and I work out of the HPC and AI Innovation Lab uh, in Dell Technologies' Austin campus. Oh, that's great, Garima. So Garima is going to be a regular on HPC Now, and we're going to call these segments News and Views, and where we're going to bring relevant information on HPC to all of you. And hopefully this, you know, you'll find this useful. So Grima, what, what's going on now? What do you have? Um, I've got, a, I've got, I think about three or four things I wanted to show you uh, since we last spoke, you know, okay. they, they kind of caught my fancy. So the first one is uh, uh, this really cool graph I saw. All right. Can you show it to us? Yeah. So let me pull it up. So the first thing I wanted to show you was this really cool uh, graph that I came across. Cool from a graph point of view, not cool from the data that the graph is representing. Oh, right, exactly. And, uh, you know, like uh, our team, we do a lot of publications, we write up a lot of our results, and we're constantly yeah. drawing charts and graphs to illustrate a point. 
And so I thought that, the, so that's one of the reasons that this graph totally caught my eye. So uh, this is from Reddit, and I'll tell you where the graph comes from as well. But this particular okay. picture was on Reddit. There's a subreddit called uh, Data is Beautiful, right? So this was posted there. And what this shows us is, uh, you know, almost 2,000 years of uh, diseases and pandemics and uh, illnesses that killed a whole bunch of people. So each ball, each fluffy ball is a sickness. And the big one you can see is the Black Death, for example. And the size of the ball, which is like the volume of the ball, the size of the ball represents the percentage of the world's population that was killed by that disease. So, you know, if there's a lot of people killed, but it's a smaller percentage of the world's population, the size of the ball is smaller. And then next to each uh, ball, you can see there's an arrow and it tells you exactly how many people died. So this was, you know, eye-opening to see uh, how many people things like the Black Death killed. And even the Spanish flu, which we hear about so much in the news and which wasn't so far back, you know, it killed like 40 to 50 million people. And, uh, you know, this particular right, right. Uh, chart shows a pretty high estimate for COVID. But of course, for COVID-19, you know, we, we're we still in the um, in the early months of this uh, pandemic. And uh, the this graph shows data for the entire duration, right? Multiple years. Uh, so what's interesting is the, yeah, I can see on this graph that they have three estimates for COVID-19 here. Yeah. One of them is really tiny, but we're already exceeded that. Uh, yeah, no, number. so it's it's not that tiny because these are deaths. Oh, well, yeah, but I meant the physical size compared to yes, everything yes, else. Yes, yes, But again, there's more people in the world too. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. And I mean, one of the things that, that was interesting about this is like, they look like flowers and then you look at it a little more closely and you're like, goodness gracious, you know, these are people dying. And it's not just uh, viruses, like the, there's more information uh, where, you know, some of these are bacteria and, uh, you right. know. And so, okay, so I wanted to show you this because I thought it was a really good um, representation and something that you know I wanted to keep in mind as we illustrate data because there's all the work that goes into you know doing a study and preparing the results but if you can present the results in a easily digestible manner that makes the import of the result you know that much easier to understand um, and that's what I really liked about this visual. Oh that, this is just is a brilliant diagram you can grasp the impact right away and there's a tremendous amount of information in here. This is, this is, I mean, I have a particular appreciation for people that can relate data in a very cogent way that you pick up right away. It's, I, I don't know, I think I, I, it's very hard to do this actually. I think, you know, I can always do graphs, right? I can yep. do graphs, I can show bar graphs, I can show all sorts of stuff, but to think of it in three dimensional format that really relays the, and also gets the information across, you know, about how serious this is, right? Yep. You, can, you can get it right away. This is beautiful, Karima. So the source, right? So we want to make sure that we attribute. So, you know, there's mm -hmm. a little note here that says this visual is heavily inspired by a graph that was at visualcapitalist.com. And, uh, right. uh, sorry, let me find it. So Visual Capitalist is a publication and, you know, they, they talk about in their about page about how they want to make data and complex things easier to understand. And this is the original infographic. Uh, so you can see it has similar information. It's been updated with a number of deaths and, you know, it's been updated as recently as yesterday. Um, so you can see that it's got oh, yeah. a representation yeah. of deaths. Uh, and um, it, it's similar information, uh, but you can see that that graphic, which is clearly a derivative of this, is kind of easier as a JPEG, you know, to pass around. You don't need a whole big screen to kind of get all the information from it. But this is the source of this data. Very cool. That was great. So you asked me, right, like what's on your mind? And you can, you can tell like most other people uh, pretty much... Uh, we're all just talking about COVID-19. Oh, and yeah, so, absolutely. 
Right. And so one of the other things I wanted to show you was what impressive times we live in. Uh, let me quickly accept these cookie policies. There we go. So what interesting times we live in. So this is an article on nature.com. And just in the first three months of this year, or you, you can uh, three, uh, just in the first three months, maybe even three and a half months of this year, you can see how much research the world is doing, you know, collectively uh, into the topic of coronavirus and specifically COVID-19, uh, SARS-CoV-2. And this, uh, this chart shows uh, journal articles as well as preprints because a lot of uh, researchers have been uh, releasing preprints of their articles prior to publication and prior to peer review. And right. you can see this massive yeah. slope. So uh, you, we've been chatting about, you know, what interesting times we live in. The amount of scientific research being done right now is pretty remarkable. It's like truly a historic time. It's kind of sucky to be living through it. Uh, but, right. I, you know, right. you don't lose sight of the fact that the amount of scientific progress that's happening is pretty incredible. So I think what's also interesting about this graph is that the fact that to publish a paper, you have to do some research, right? There has to be some kind of laboratory study or some epidemiological study or something that you spend a lot of time on to, to bring your data together and show results, right? And so th th this isn't just like, this is incredible, the amount of papers that have been published, but every one of these papers has had a massive amount of work behind it to get that paper before that paper was printed. And so there's a huge amount of work. Being, I can just imagine how many laboratories are working around the clock on, on getting this data. Uh, you know, I, I heard another uh, interesting, uh, on Market Watch. I heard another interesting piece of data that the pressure that the... Uh, uh, pharmaceuticals are, are facing so much, um, a lot of them are collaborating without legal documentation or anything. They just said, forget it. Let's cut through all the paper tape, all the red tape. Let's just work. We'll work it out later. Let's, you know, it, it, this is such a priority. Let's drop all the red tape. Let's get together put our heads together and just find a solution. So there's a That's lot of- That's really impressive, yeah. Yeah, it is. Considering I'm, I'm sure all the lawyers are losing sleep overnight. About I, was just, I was just thinking, yeah, but like from a human progress point of view, right? And you can see that like that previous nature graph that I showed, that was um, just the last three months uh, uh, of this year. The, but if you look at this one, so this is from The Economist um, yeah. and it's showing- like scientific research uh, articles mentioning coronavirus, right? I mean, this goes back 60 years. You could see, you know, there's a peak with SARS and there's a peak with MERS. And then just in these first five months of 2020, there's this huge peak. And this is the, the COVID-19 peak. So this is very interesting. So it says the number of scientific articles mentioning coronavirus, right? This goes back to what, 1965? Yeah. People were writing papers on coronaviruses back then. It, yeah. I guess it wasn't in. <laughs> That's true. But I mean, you know, there's, there's all, uh, even the common cold as we're all experts now, right? Even the common cold is a coronavirus. Uh, and you can see like it really took off, for example, with, with these, um, with SARS, which is not so long back. Right. You know what? I'd be very interested. Look at these peaks. Uh, were those outbreaks? You know what yes. I mean? Do you see it? Yep. 19, 1990, uh, 84, 82, 95, uh, 2001, I guess. Mm -hmm. And then bang, SARS. Yep. Yeah, SARS was pretty scary. That was pretty scary. Yeah. And so the other thing when I look at this that, that makes me realize is that, you know, really in 2030 are we going to be like look at this pattern right there's well there's a we, pattern yeah and you know we we seem to have short memories as humans right we get past something and then but hopefully this time around we'll have um, policy changes as well and 
you know, whatever we need to do in our healthcare systems as well, so that we can uh, ride out the next one better. And then on the Dell front, so uh, I don't know if you'd heard uh, that, uh, you know, you know, TGen, Translational Genomics Research yep. Institute. And uh, mm -hmm. so TGen's been doing uh, research and some investigations on COVID. And uh, they've, they've been actually using uh, the Zenith supercomputer in the HPC and AI Innovation Lab. Yeah, and, and, and the Zenith, you might want to describe just two seconds on the Zenith, what it is. That's right. So uh, TJ has been using the Zenith supercomputer in the HPC and AI Innovation Lab. And Zenith is our top 500 class system. It's got over 500 servers, over one petaflops of measured performance. Um, and so this is our large supercomputer in our lab. And uh, TJ uh, you know, reached out and we immediately uh, gave them access and, you know, gave them cycles on, on Zenith so that their research, you know, to assist them with computing capability for their research. And uh, there was a Rocky Mountain Advanced Computing Consortium conference growing, going on. Actually, it's today and yesterday. And James Lowy from TJ and yeah. myself and my colleague Luke, we presented uh, yesterday. And James talked about some of the COVID work TGen's been doing um, and, you know, all the different areas that they're working on. We've all heard about, you know, testing, tracing. There's one more. Right. And, you know, the vaccine development. So. Yeah. Thank you very much, Karima. And looking forward to talking to you again on our next podcast. All right. Yeah, so this stay... was fun. Yeah, it was. So stay safe and healthy, okay? And have you a too, good Tony. weekend. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And hey, I like your hat. That's kind of cool. Yeah. So these these are going to be available. So I like it. Yeah. All right. You're Thanks. getting one. So thank you. <laughs> that's that's awesome. That's that's what I was angling for. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll see you. Bye bye. So. Hey, how did you? Who hey. are you? Hello. Is this Tony? Yes, this is Tony, but how did you get here? This is Tony Ray of Dell Technologies. Yes, that's me, but what, you're messing around. What, what, who, how did you get in here? Yeah, I'm, I'm the Damon. That's me. Damien? Your name no, is not Damien. Damien, not Damien. Damon, Damon. Like, you know, the Damon in your machine. <laughs> what, are you kidding? A Damon? Yes, Damon, yes. I know everything what, about you're... HPCs. Oh, yeah. All right. So, but wait, you're, I don't understand how, hold on a second. Yeah, you, you don't worry about that, Tony. I know my way around an HPC system like a cat around a... I don't understand what happened. I don't know, a cat around something, but I'm really good. So I hear you're doing this podcast on HPC or high-performance computing okay. that you're calling you know, HPC Now. Yeah, see, up here, HPC Now, right? Yeah, HPC Now. What is this HPC Now? Well, it's a podcast to instruct people that are just getting interested in HPC and also, you know, experts in HPC to learn more about high-performance computing. And get oh, really? Experts, huh? Yeah. Tony, when was the last time you used a command line? What? Do you oh. even know what a command line is? Yes, I know what a command line. Years ago, I used a command line, but I don't use it anymore. All right, you Windows I jockey. Anymore. I don't believe you at all. Oh. <laughs> do, you, do you know what a job scheduler is? <laughs> well, actually, 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 we have that today on the podcast. And if you're in my system, you would have seen that interview with Dr. Albert Ruther from MIT Lincoln Lab. He talked all about schedulers. Well, he knows so schedulers, yes. But I asked you, you're the host. What well, do you I, know about I, I HPC? I know some about schedulers. I've been in the HPC business a long time, but but I mean, I haven't really used schedulers, you know, maybe a long time ago I did, but not right now. But, uh, you know, the whole purpose of the podcast is to help instruct people and teach them about things like schedulers and how clusters work. All right, good. I hope you are teaching them about the command line. None of that gooey stuff. Oh, oh come on. What do, you, what do you, don't like gooey? Well, I, sometimes I, I like GUIs. I like I to play that. my solitaire with a GUI. It doesn't quite work just as well on the command line, but you know. You know, you, you play solitaire with a command line interface? No, it, it doesn't quite work as well. So I think that's one of the few things where I do think like, you know, the GUI works rather well, but. Yeah, really. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. in modern day, 
Now, GUI makes it easier for more people than just experts to use computers like high-performance computing clusters, right? So GUI helps a lot of people who aren't familiar with command line or Linux commands. Are you okay? Do you, do you see what I'm doing? Do you see well, what I'm doing? Yes, I see what you're doing. Yeah, I, I'm looking for where this, this magical GUI that you talk about is. It's, I don't see it anywhere. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 you know, it's on a machine and it's an interface. That ha you know what it is. I, don't, I still don't understand how you're in the system or how you yeah. got, how you got, how you got. Anyways, you know, yeah, don't you worry about me, Tony. I'm going to keep you straight on your HPC Now podcast. I'll make sure that you only give the facts and the facts as they stand. All well, right. Not, not, not if I can prevent that. Oh, we'll see don't... about that. I still don't... I still... <laughs> All right. I'm signing off. See you what? later, gooey boy. Oh, Jesus. I don't believe that. So that wraps it up for this podcast number one. Hope you enjoyed it and got something out of it. Next podcast is going to be coming really soon, and it's going to feature HPC file systems. We're going to talk about all different kinds of file systems and technologies, and it's going to be a pretty interesting discussion. We're also going to have our news and views with Grima Kochar, and she's going to have some pretty interesting things to talk about also. So I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, looking forward to seeing you again. And remember, you can put comments uh, and suggestions uh, on podcasts and things like that to comments at hbcnow.org. Thank you very much, and please stay safe.